This is me, I'm harvesting bio crust here. Uh, this was a few years ago, it's a citizen science project in collaboration with Northern Arizona University, trying to grow uh, this bumpy black stuff, which is actually lichen, uh, cyanobacteria and algae uh, and mosses uh, on the desert floor. And it uh, helps keep down the, knits the desert floor together, keeping down wind storms, uh, holding in moisture so that other plants can grow and uh, uh, preventing erosion. Hey, Roger. Yeah. Um, some, some people are having a hard time hearing you. Do we yeah. have a microphone? Yeah, it's supposed to be on. It is. Is it? It's not. Oh, it's not? It sounds like it's on to me. <laughs> no, it's really it's oh. forward too. If you guys want to you know, All right. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, well, in the conservancy here, we we mainly help the city manage and uh and protect the preserve, uh manage the trails. So we'll be talking about the deserts, the preserve, conservancy, mainly about the plants. Everything's interconnected. You mess up one thing and you're likely to affect another. Uh, so the preserve was established in 1995. The ideas for it uh, came a bit before that, a few years before. Uh, currently, uh, and by voter rep referendum, it would, the people of Scottsdale voted to increase sales tax to get the funding to buy the land for the preserve. Uh, currently, it's uh, a little over 30,000 acres um, and uh, 200 plus miles of trail. So uh, CNM is a worthy opportunity and it's located in the Sonoran Desert. The, the, uh, there are four deserts in North America, and they're all in our area, the Southwest area. Uh, the Sonoran Desert is the one with the greatest diversity. Uh, and here, uh, they're, they're all, oops, I have to get the right. They're all labeled here. Great Basin, Mojave, the smallest one, it's about a quarter of the size of uh, the, the Sonoran Desert, 100,000 acres here and 25,000 here, uh, square, square miles, I should say. Uh, and Chihuahua and Desert, the Great Basin, the Chihuahua is said to be the biggest one, but uh, the Great Basin is pretty much uh, the same size. It's a little difficult uh, for researchers to actually establish the, the real boundaries of the desert, uh, as you might imagine, you know, are the plants and the diversity too great or too, to, to be desert? Is the aridity enough? And we'll go through some of those things. So let's see. Oh, in uh, the early 50s, it was Forest Shreve that uh, established seven original regions of the Sonoran Desert. And the seventh region was this foothills of Sonora. And uh, that's the one that has been deleted now. We have only six uh, regions in the Sonoran Desert now. And it was deleted because the uh, trees were too tall, plants too many, too much rainfall. Uh, so, uh, so it was said, well, this really isn't desert. Uh, the, on the cusp of that is, uh, let's see here, Plains of Sonora and our Arizona upland. Uh, we in Scottsdale kind of border the Arizona upland and the Colorado River Basin. Uh, the Colorado River Basin is much drier. Uh, the Arizona upland is uh, is more moist, about 12 inches of rain a year, a year here, and uh, and so Arizona upland is where Brown's Ranch is located, pretty much, and so the diversity in the plants are diversity is greater, and the plants are more there. Uh, there is some talk of reclassifying plains of Sonora, which uh, down, this is down in Mexico now, and uh, um, and, and this and is mostly irrigated and is mostly farmland. 
So there is some talk of reclassifying as thorn scrub as this was here, the foothills. Uh, and if Plains of Sonora is reclassified, so would uh, us <laughs> in the Arizona upland. So lower Colorado River Valley, uh, it's, it's hot and dry there. It's the hottest and driest part of the Sonoran Desert. And, and it really, the arid core here is over by Yuma. And then we go down in the Baja for um, Vizcano and Magdalena. And, uh, and here on the central Gulf, Gulf Coast uh, is where it's the most arid. And, and that's where the Cardones grow. They also grow over here in Baja. Uh, and because they are big enough to store enough water to last through like three years of drought. Uh, th there has been as many as three years of drought in a row in Yuma, uh, but, and so it's, it's uh, really uh, hot and dry there. Okay, let's see. Yeah, Chihuahua Desert. Let's see if I get it, yeah. Uh, unprotected from the northern blast, so, so it freezes on a regular basis, so this limits diversity here. But it's still quite diverse and lush, pretty much like the Sonoran Desert, but the freezing uh, prevents the diversity. And the Great Basin, uh, pretty much the only thing that grows there is big sagebrush. Uh, it has very limited diversity and hot, hot summers and cold, cold winters, and similar to the steppes of Europe, steppes of Asia. Oops. Mojave, the smallest one, uh, the boundaries of the Mojave are defined by the Joshua tree and the uh, Mojave rattlesnake, everybody's familiar with, kind of a green tint rather than a brown tint, like the Western diamondback. Mojave has a neurotoxin, so you get paralyzed if you get bit, whereas Western Diamondback generally has a hematoxin. Uh, some of the Mojaves, though, have both, so you'd be in really bad shape. It's a 911 call anyway. So, and did I say the Joshua tree is what defines the boundaries there? Yeah, Death Valley, it has the hottest spot uh, almost in the world uh, in, in, the, in Death Valley. Uh, but it also freezes on a regular basis, so that uh, is what limits the diversity. Uh, let's see. And so what makes uh, us here in the Sonoran Desert unique? Uh, it, it, despite the snow, which may break the branches on the, on the trees, uh, it doesn't freeze on a regular basis here. So, so this, uh, this accounts for uh, really a lot of the diversity and, uh, and the adaptations in the plants, uh, also two rainfalls per year. So, so the, the plants don't have to go that long in between rains. So we have lots of micro environments, tree shade, rock shade, uh, up and down with the mountains. Uh, so, so we have nurse plants for other plants to grow under. The saguaro cactus occurs is unique. You know you're in the Sonoran Desert if you see a Sonoran cactus. Uh, if you see a saguaro cactus, and uh, and but it doesn't occur in the whole, in all of the Sonoran Desert. Only about half of it, and that's the southern, uh, the southern half of Arizona and uh, down into Mexico, not over by Yuma. It does occur over on the Baja, along with the Cardones. Cardones are a relative of the saguaro. So the ironwood tree, though, um, is what def that, that will define the boundaries of the Sonoran Desert, just like the, um, the Joshua tree does for the Mojave Desert. So, let's see. So is it endangered, causes of decreased diversity? Uh, you don't don't see much of this anymore in the Sonoran Desert. Sometimes when it rains, it, it's in the washes, but uh, a lot of water being pumped out. So uh, non-natives are uh, a big cause of decreased diversity. Uh, uh, they they will take over an area, and so you don't have the native plants <laughs> growing in the area. Uh, 
because they're good competitors, usually coming from Asia, Africa, Mediterranean. So uh, we have tree or the uh, <coughs> we we have trees and uh, annuals and grasses. Um, so loss of riparian areas, like I said, and environmental fragmentation. Did we did we see that in the preserve? The, Yeah, I was going to, uh-oh. Oh, what? Escape. I think I just blew it here. Yeah, I think I may have forgot to comment on something there <coughs> in the, uh-oh. Uh okay. Oh, let's see. Yeah, go back. Let's see. Oh yeah, here we go, like this. See, the, 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 here's the, I, I, yeah, I forgot to comment on the, uh, on the layout of the preserve. Uh, southern area connected to the northern area by this narrow isthmus and that's what, and then uh, urban development uh, everywhere else. And so, so this is an example of, environmental fragmentation, what's meant by that? Fragmentation. So it, the corridor for plants and animals is interrupted. And so, and, and obviously interrupted here, only connected by a narrow isthmus. Uh, so, but, but the, what, I was, what I was saying before, the, the diversity is less down here because this is kind of more like uh, Colorado River Basin, the Southern area of the preserve. Uh, and the northern area, Brown's Ranch, uh, kind of more like the Arizona upland, which has uh, greater, uh, more water, and it's higher up, so it's a little bit cooler. So, so this is that's what the fragmentation is. Uh, the and this is good here because the southern area of the preserve is bordered on the east by McDowell Mountain Regional Park and Tonto on the northeast. So, so a big corridor is there, a big area for uh, the plants and the animals. Okay, now let's see if we can get back. Where were we? And Mojave and Sonora. Okay. Yes, the three bad guys, uh, fountain, red brome, and buffalo grass. Yeah, and and they're hot fires, uh, and and uh, really good competitors crowding out the native plants. So fountain grass was introduced as a decorative. So I'm sure you've seen it uh, around the town, and and if you go out in the preserve. Uh, it, it's, it's really, really quite notable in some of the washes, uh, just seas of grass. So that there are studies underway now, uh, and led by Paul Steger, uh, for one, uh, to try to figure out what to do, uh, with the non-native grasses. So it's a bunch grass. It was native in Air Africa interrupts the usual flow of water in the wash so and it's not a very very good uh, uh, fodder for the uh, native animals um, and uh, so it alters the wildlife habit habitat and like I said it, it produces hot fires all of the non-native grasses do and buffalo grass this was introduced uh, to feed cattle uh, but it's probably better to replant the native grasses because the cattle actually prefer that over the ones that are brought in from uh, elsewhere. So again, uh, produces hot fires. Uh, it's, uh, it is a very good competitor, dense roots. Uh, actually, if you let it go for years, uh, then the, the ground the uh, soil won't uh, tolerate any growth of any plants anymore. So it, it really decreases the fertility. It's bad for the 
uh, and bad for the desert. The uh, desert isn't adapted to the fires, uninterrupted fuel. Uh, and red brome, uh, this is also considered a bunch of grass, but, uh, but it really kind of grows diffusely. It's kind of naturalized now, uh, but uh, try to control the fire, uh, fire hazard. That's the management goal. So, and this is a new one, uh, relatively new. Steve Jones saw some examples up in uh, the Browns Ranch area has kind of a feathery top there, uh, but a bunch of grass, uh, delicate seed panicles. And, uh, and it was brought in again as a cattle feed, uh, as was red brome. Red brome, the cattle really didn't like that. They wouldn't eat it because they try to pull it up and it'd come up by the roots. Uh, it's a bit, very superficial roots in the red brome. Uh, and, uh, and the seeds, the seed pods cut their tongues. Uh, th those are the same things that get stuck in your socks and are very irritating. Uh, so, uh, the, and the lame and love grass is, is the cattle didn't, what, they would prefer to eat the native plants. So, but they will eat the, uh, the love grass and, uh, and also the uh, buffalo grass. Uh, so it, uh, it likes to establish in disturbed areas and, uh, and it, again, like the other uh, invasives is a uh, strong competitor. Uh, I believe it, all of them are sensitive to glyphosate and that's basically Roundup. What did you say they're all sensitive to what? Uh, to, to the bottom, to the glyphosate here. Oh. And that, that has to be sprayed though, but trying to spray red brome is probably, you're probably not gonna uh, get very, you know, you're gonna kill a lot of other things too. So, well, and stink net, uh, it has uh, pretty yellow flowers, but uh, that's about its own, only uh, good thing. It, it does kind of smell acrid and it will, uh, uh, it will, sometimes you get skin allergy if you touch it and also uh, uh, the uh, aroma from it may give you uh, respiratory problems. Uh, it does crowd out the natives just like the, uh, the uh, grasses do. And we've had a rain now, we get a couple more rains and we can, we'll probably expect a good stink net year, so. Uh, so on a pretty much, I, you know, it may, it may be that spray works on it, but, but pulling it up, but you have to bag it so the seeds don't spread around. I was going to ask you that, and maybe for Paul too. Yeah. So if we're out riding our bike and we see, um, not just stink net, but brome or whatever, yeah. what's the best thing to do? Well, yeah, brome, well, you're not going to be able to do much about. Yeah. Better to do something or anything than nothing. Yeah, but pull it out better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't think so. Once you pull it out, those seeds are free, are free to be dried. Well, and, and yeah, we're coming to Sahara mustard, and uh, those things that, that plant dies, and then it's a tumbleweed, mm -hmm. and so then the seeds tumble all over the place. So, um, so anyway, yeah, if you see this one here, uh, if you see it uh, to prevent the spread, the best way is, uh, you know, carry some bags if you're, and, and put it in a bag and put it in the trash. Yeah, and, and in a bag, not like a garbage bag with a, with a pull tie, it's gotta be twisted around so that nothing can get out of the bag. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be the seeds. That is the seeds. Yeah, but that's not that's right. Right. Yes. right. That's so the flower. If yeah. Brown out the old vegetable to get it to come up is good enough, right? 
and we can lay it and leave it there. Yes. Oh. It's better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah, but it's probably still better. It, it could still develop. Right. Even if it happens, it happens. Okay. Yeah. So it's better to it's better just to bag it and, and be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these things are, you know, strong competitors. Uh, they're and they're in a place where they don't have any, uh, nothing is resisting them. Uh, you know, they're they're out of their they're out of their natural habitat where they have things that eat them and stuff. Uh, but here, uh, there there isn't anything. So, oh yeah, and here we are. It's the hair of mustard. This one you can identify because of the bumpy leaves, and it shoots up a flower stalk with. Uh, so big rosette here, basal rosette of bumpy leaves, and then shoots up a flower stalk with a small yellow flower. Uh, and then the plant, the plant will die and make a skeleton. It looks kind of like that, and but it, but tan, and then it'll uh, and breaks off and and then tumbles across uh, the land, uh, dispersing its seeds. So it is uh, like other musters. It is. The basal part here, especially when young, uh, is edible uh, because the oxalic acid content is not too much. Uh, but um, but that you know that seems to be a small good thing in, in as opposed to the real bad uh, decreased diversity. So let's see. Oh, the borage plants for this were, um, uh, they, they seem to be somewhat resistant, especially the uh, fiddle neck and facelia. Um, those, that's, those are the white and yellow flowers. Uh, fiddle neck yellow and facelia purple. Uh, okay, so London rocket, that's another mustard. It has a basal rosette here and a stalk with small yellow flowers. And this is the rocket part. Uh, this also would be edible uh, the, as, as greens. Uh, the uh, tamarisk, uh, only saving grace here is the dark honey that uh, is uh, apparently uh, really good. Um, so the leaves are, it, it produces a dense shade and so nothing much can grow under it. It soaks up a lot of water too, so so this is uh, this is worth getting rid of. Um, and the uh, desert broom uh, is a native, uh, but it but it's kind of messy, and so and it, but it does attract butterflies too. So if you want the butterflies, you plant the males. It's a dioecious plant, so plant the males. There's turpentine in the foreground here, and this. This white one with all the snow is is the uh, desert broom. How do, you know so, if it's a male how do you know if it's a male or? Plant. Well, you have to go to the. I guess maybe the nursery would know. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I I don't know that you can tell real well from. <laughs> yeah, but you you can tell after the. Uh, uh, you know the the females look like this, but the but the males. Uh, uh, you know they have a they have a different flower, uh, and so so you can tell them after after they're the plant after they grow into the plant. But that is a th this is a female here. Yeah. And, and are those all seeds? Yeah, th those are those are seeds that will disperse. Yes, and this one this one is not so good because it does also soak up a lot of water, but it is a native plant. So what makes a desert? Uh, in order to establish that, it's a high aridity index, actually. And uh, the aridity index uh, is determined by uh, researchers set out a pan of water and, uh, and then see how much of it evaporates over a year, over a, a period of time and extrapolate that to a year. The, uh, um, the aridity then, uh, it is from transpiration and evaporation, and that is roughly 60% of pan evaporation, which is this pan that was set out and the water that uh, evaporated from that measured. So 60% of that 
uh, divided by the uh, rainfall per year will give you the index. And uh, semi-arid is determined to be th uh, three times as much water lost as replaced by rainfall. And uh, at Tucson, the index is five to one, five times as much water lost through pan evaporation as uh, that's aridity and transpiration together uh, as replaced by rainfall. And this is about what it is in the Northern Preserve Around Yuma, arid core of Sonoran Desert, uh, that's 30 to 1. And Northern Preserve, like we said, uh, Southern Preserve, probably about 8 to 1. Sahara Desert is uh, 600 to 1. So really dry there. Uh, yeah. The OK, rain shadow effect. Uh, that's uh, all the rain drops before it gets to the desert. And then the horse latitudes. Uh, these were named back in the 1800s when uh, the mariners uh, coming up from around the equator hit 30 degrees and saw all the dead horses in the water. Mm -hmm. And that was because they were thrown overboard because their boats have become, uh, the boats going before had, had become becalmed and uh, because of descending air, they didn't move, they didn't have motors. Uh, so they threw the horses overboard to conserve water. And, uh, and so there, there are deserts that run along the string of the, of the horse latitudes above and below the equator. So by the time the air is rising from the equator and, and then it moves towards the horse latitude. By the time it gets to the horse latitude, it's lost all its moisture start and cool so then it starts descending and that descending air as it warms soaks up even more moisture so it's going to it's not going to rain it's going to be really dry in the horse latitudes and uh, sonoran desert has both the uh, rain shadow effect and the horse latitude effect so so adaptive challenges intense sun uh, destroys chlorophyll, the sun does, the radiation, and uh, the freezing cold, as we talked about, uh, predators eating the plants, and competition with other plants. And so what did I do? Okay. Oh, so anatomic, metabolic, and mechanical adaptive strategies that plants have developed. Uh, anatomical includes succulents, store enough water to get through the drought, shallow and deep roots, both. Um, saguaro actually has a tap root that goes down to some extent, about a couple feet, and also shallow roots that are extending out laterally. Uh, waxy surfaces to retard transpiration, uh, spines, thorns, and glockets to keep from being eaten, and skeletons to support the water weight. So metabolic, the specialized photosynthesis, CAM, and C4, crassulacean acid metabolism. That's what saguaro has and several other plants that are in the desert, uh, especially the large succulents. And this means that the saguaro is able to open its pores at night and take in carbon dioxide, store it as a four carbon acid and use it for photosynthesis the next day. The, uh, the, the heat uh, is, or the, it's cooler when at night when the carbon dioxide is being taken in. So that favors uh, production or, or transformation to the acid. And then the next day when it warms up, that favors uh, the production of the gas carbon dioxide. So, and then this is used in photosynthesis, the C4, is where the uh, transport molecule, which is actually malic acid, is transported to uh, specialized cells, but the, the bundle cells. And, uh, and then the, the, the photosynthesis is done right on the spot. Uh, so, and it's, it's a way of getting around uh, photorespiration, which 
the Rubisco, the first enzyme of photosynthesis will take up oxygen instead of carbon dioxide if it's not right there in the hot environment. Uh, and next, yeah, small leaves like in uh, Foothill Palo Verde, those are some of the smallest leaves you'll see on a tree. And, uh, and the plants will lose their leaves, uh, sometimes in drought uh, to conserve the water, they even lose branches. Uh, the jojoba has a, a vertical orientation so that uh, noontime, when, when the sun is overhead and the hottest, then uh, the, the leaf is vertically oriented rather than flat out to soak up all the heat. So, uh, and then uh, brittle bush has a bunch of hairs. A lot of plants have hairs, but that's why the brittle bush leaves look pale is because they have, they're hairy as opposed to goldeneye, which has greener leaves and grows more up by Brown's Ranch where it's cooler. <laughs> so, so the plants are pretty smart really. And uh, you probably heard of the escape of aid and dur kind of thing, uh, but some resist and just store the water against the drought. And so now the plants, to be a cactus, you have to have the proper flower. And that means, and lots of male parts, lots of female parts. Uh, and that means the, the, uh, the proper flower includes the fused uh, sepal and petal, and that is called a tepal. And you can see that on the, in this region here, you can see how the petal is kind of green there. So these are tepals here. And then there are lots of male parts here and uh, several female parts. Uh, okay, and then uh, abortive branches, those are the, the areoles uh, that give rise to glockids, very irritating on the opuntia and the spines and the spines are actually th these are the these are the modified branches and these are the leaves so you can think of cacti in in four groups uh, columnar jointed or segmented uh, clumping and camouflaged and the columnar of course saguaro saguaro and barrel and then the Cardone organ pipe and Sunita, you can see those at the, uh, at the museums or uh, uh, botanical gardens uh, and then down by Tucson desert museums. Sunita has, uh, has whiskers at the top, kind of, that, that spines look like whiskers. So, oh, I didn't. And here we have the segmented cacti and the, and the prickly pear. Prickly, prickly pear is also a segmented cactus and teddy bear and buckhorn. The clumping cacti, mammillaria and hedgehog. Hedgehog is ribbed and mammillaria is tuberculate. So it's kind of smooth and you have to look hard for this one under bushes, et cetera. Uh, but it has, but it's worth the look because it has a beautiful ring of flowers. The uh, hedgehog, though, is the first one that usually flowers in the uh, in the spring, and it has big, beautiful flowers too. Uh, most of the cacti do uh, to attract the pollinators. The camouflage variety you have to uh, get up uh, early in the morning. Uh, they come out at night, late at night, and uh, but it, but they're still blooming early in the morning, so you can you can see them then. Uh, researchers uh, uh, down by Tucson uh, once uh, thought that they had all of the um, Queen of the Night in one area. And so then they were, and, but when they went back, when they bloomed, they found twice as many. So these, these things are really quite well camouflaged. Ironwood tree is, is a plant that, uh, is one of the camouflage plants. And saguaro, saguaro was formerly in the genus Sirius until Andrew Carnegie uh, donated a bunch of money down by Tucson and then it was named, uh, renamed in honor of him. So uh, 
It is the indicator plant of the Sonoran Desert, but as I said, only occurs in about 50% of our half Arizona, Southern Arizona and down in New Mexico. It's the Arizona state flower uh, and the fully hydrated uh, 40 foot saguaro with uh, lots of arms, 30 arms. Sometimes they'll have as many as 30 arms. Uh, will go six, six to seven tons. So these are uh, heavy plants. And so they need that woody rib structure to uh, support them. And there on the right, you see a small saguaro. Oops. And th this, this is really a rough estimate of the, of the growth pattern. Uh, at, at first, it, it's, it's slow. That's what this indicates. But after it reaches 30 to 40 years, then, uh, then there's a growth spurt up to about 70, to year, 70 years. And so, um, so at 60 years, it'll be a 10 feet, 100 years, uh, maybe up to 20, 30 feet or so. And it could live as long as 200 years, maybe longer. It gets arms, uh, that's, this is the dogma after 50 years of its growing where in really good conditions, soil and water, then it may get the arms um, quicker than that. The, uh, the arms allow uh, more water storage. So, so they're gonna be more arms where there's more water. And, uh, and also it allows more reproduction because their flowers come out at the edge or at the end of the arms and at the top. So uh, the arms occur above the widest diameter of the trunk. So that's usually about eight feet and, and on up. Whereas Cardone, massive uh, relative of saguaro, those arms come out much lower and the trunk is much more massive on Cardone. So it stores a lot more water. So it can survive down there in the Gulf Coast region. Uh, uh, let's see. Now to tell the difference, uh, one of the big differences, barrel versus saguaro. Uh, here is saguaro and, and it, has, it has a quite a linear configuration here and gray straight spines. The external ribs or pleats are uh, uh, linearly oriented. Uh, they may be split, but but the linearity is a is a big feature here, and so the pleats have a dual function, and one of them expand and contract with water gain and loss, but the other one is uh, the shadows, the pleat shadows, and it's the so that's got a dual function, and it, and the spines do too, spines protection of course but the spines are making shadows too. So at any one time, saguaro surface is 70% shaded in full sunlight. So linear pattern though, that's the big key for saguaro. And uh, so that it has to have this woody support system though, to support all that water weight. The ribs tend to be fused at the bottom and in the pits of the arms. So, uh, and the holes that you're gonna, that you'll see in the saguaro that are made by woodpeckers and those, the Gila woodpecker makes hole uh, lower down. And so, because it's a smaller bird and it can live between the skin and the ribs, but the flicker woodpecker uh, is a bigger bird. So it has to make a hole higher up where the, because the ribs tend to get thinner and spread apart higher up. So the, that woodpecker then can get through the ribs and uh, make its hole there up high. This, is, this may be kind of bad for the saguaro though, because that weakens the top, which may blow off then in a windstorm. Uh, but then after the top blows off, there's loss of some kind of arm inhibiting substance. And so the arms grow up uh, like an umbrella uh, after the top blows off. So the, the, the ribs and the roots are connected intimately together though. 
Uh, and if you take a look at the <coughs> cross section of the rib, uh, then it, you'll notice that it's porous on the, on the cut surface. And, and that's because it has the xylem there and, and the, the water is coming up straight from the roots through the ribs uh, and then dispersed in the cactus. So uh, the, and with that uh, cam metabolism, the saguaro, it's sort of an idling metabolism. It's going all the time. So the saguaro can put out tiny root hairs very quickly after a major rainfall and within 24 hours can soak up uh, up to 200 gallons of water. So very efficient uh, at conserving the water. Uh, swar most of the um, cacti have black seeds. Uh, the opuntias, the segmented cacti, buckhorn, uh, teddy bear have pale seeds, um, but the saguaro has white flowers, black seeds, red fruits. If you see something on the saguaro that kind of looks like a flower uh, and it's red, it's a fruit and not a flower because the flowers are white. Oh, and then if you're having trouble telling uh, a bud, sometimes the, the buds can be, it can kind of look like green fruits. Uh, you know, a globular thing, you know, well, is it a fruit or a bud? Well, look for the, look for the calyx on the top. And sometimes they're not as prominent as this, but if there's a little uh, black or brown black kind of structure on the top and, and, it, and it's hard and sharp, uh, Native Americans had, had, the fruit came with its own knife. So, um, so, but if you see the calyx on the top, then it's a fruit. It's a green fruit, not a bud. So the birds haven't quite got to that yet, but without the black seeds in there, it could look like a red flower, but flowers are white, fruits are red, and seeds are black. They, the Native Americans would dry these and store them, and uh, they're certainly edible. Oh, down south, uh, bats may play a role in the pollination, uh, but, but mainly saguaros are pollinated by birds and bees. And the bats pollinate cardones, uh, but, and maybe sometimes saguaro. Yeah, so the saguaro flower, white, fruit red, calyx, buds, woodpeckers, the gila and the flicker, the, this is, this is Gila here. So this uh, is probably further down. And oh, epidermal browning, that's normal on a cactus. So is the barky appearance at the bottom on a saguaro, crested saguaro. Uh, that may, uh, this may be a, you know, a genetic aberration or frost damage where the ball of cells that doesn't grow as a globular uh, or tube anymore, it spreads out linear. And so, so then that's what accounts for, the linear growth is what accounts uh, for the crested saguaro, uh, but the cause uh, is perhaps up for grabs. Uh, it could be frost damage, uh, it could be genetic aberration. So, and then often you'll no notice that um, that saguaro wound where the arm is broken off or whatever is black. And then certainly when you go to clean up a fallen saguaro, you see the black soup that's, that really smells kind of bad. And the black is because that's melanin that is doing that. That's why it's black. And when the area of saguaro is injured, it, uh, it floods that area with dopamine which is, uh, which is the same thing as a neurotransmitter in human beings in the, in the brain and uh, in, deficient in Parkinson's disease. It's the same thing. And it may, it may very well be active in transduction, cell signaling or whatever in the saguaro. Uh, but but, that's, but it's oxid the dopamine is then oxidized to melanin. So that's why the saguaro wounds look dark black. So barrel, barrel versus saguaro. Uh, right away, you kind of notice that it's sort of curvy 
And the spines here obscure the body a little bit more than what they do in the saguaro. And so, but the, you still have the spine, spine shadows and pleat shadows and still the dual function of each. Uh, spines on the barrel, curvy red and ridged and on the saguaro gray and straight. So this becomes a problem telling them apart when they're young. And, uh, you know, new stewards coming to the uh, desert, uh, you know, is that a barrel or a saguaro, you know, this little cactus. And, but that's, but look at the spines, then you'll be able to tell. Uh, curvy red ridged on the barrel and gray and straight on the saguaro and the saguaro has that distinctive linear configuration, whereas there, there's curvy appearance here in the barrel, uh, both in cylindracea, cylindraceous and with lizani that we have in the preserve, the kind that grow straighter up or cylindraceous and with lizani are the kind that lean more uh, towards the Southwest and, and probably more appropriately termed compass barrel rather than the kind that we have in the preserve. Uh, but you can use compass barrels. Sometimes they really do lean over to the southwest because they burn up on the side that the sun is burning or that, the, that is exposed to the sun and grow on the other side. And so then they start leaning. The barrel cactus doesn't have the woody support that the saguaro does. And so uh, it can blow over uh, a lot easier. It doesn't grow as tall either. Um, so can you right up to that cactus, chop off the top and drink the water out? No, because it's got the oxalic acid in it. And uh, th this is not the, the photosynthesis transport molecule, but it's a, it's a, a product that's made because uh, it has the carbon fixed uh, by the photosynthesis. And oxalic acid is, is a very important uh, chelating agent. And so it could be used in desert restoration for restoring uh, degraded desert soils uh, because it'll take heavy metals out. Uh, but the chelation also applies to the calcium. So it regulates stomal cells and, and those are the, responsible for opening and closing the cactus pores. So, so it very, oxalic acid and it has the additional function of being bitter. And so the animals don't like to eat it. So, so it's a very important compound for the, uh, for the cacti. Uh, I think we hit everything there. The Siri Indians uh, and also desert survivalists have methodology for preparing a drinkable fluid from uh, barrel cacti and mainly with Liz and I, uh, not the kind that we have in the preserve, although you could probably do it with that too, if you had a still. Um, now, and some desert survivor people carry this stuff in their pack and, and can distill a drinkable fluid from barrel cactus. Uh, the Siri Indians apparently did have a methodology for uh, extracting water from the cactus. I don't know whether it was distillation or not. And here are the comparison, curvy red ridge spines on the right and obscuring the body. So that's barrel cactus and saguaro cactus. Look at that linear configuration there and the gray straight spines. So shouldn't have any trouble now telling the difference. And here are the other ones, uh, organ pipe Sunita, Sunita with its kind of whiskers on the top and uh, organ pipe, bunch of stems growing out of the ground. And then Cardone, look, th this is really massive trunk. And the arms are a little bit different configuration and tend to have more arms. And so the amount of water that this cactus can store is great. And so it, it occurs, it can occur down, you know, where there's not much rainfall. The opuncioids include the choyas and the prickly pear. And uh, their characteristics include glaucids, and these are the little uh, splinter-like um, thorns that you get, uh, they get stuck and you can't hardly see them. Uh, they have rudimentary leaves. We'll see a picture of that pretty soon. Uh, those are soft and red. And, you know, what's that red bunch of stuff occurring on the edge, on the end of the 
uh, buckhorn branch. Well, it's, uh, it's primitive leaves if it's a, in the springtime uh, at the right time of year. Uh, that the, uh, another characteristic of the choyas uh, and, and the, or the apuncheate choyas and prickly pear uh, segmental new growth, the, the, it grows in segments, cuts off at the dry period, uh, resumes when there's more rain, whereas the saguaro grows all year long. So continuous growth there. Uh, and then, so interrupted growth for the choyas. And these seeds are pale rather than black, like you saw before. So, and the fruits. Uh, so these are really good to eat. And, but the uh, pads are also edible, especially the young ones that don't have much of the oxalic acid. Uh, these are called tunas and a good place for a pack rat nest. And the cochineal dye, yeah, that's a, a red dye. And boy, was this a, this was a really tradable commodity. Uh, uh, and when the Spaniards discovered it in Mexico when they came over, uh, and a uh, closely guarded secret for hundreds of years. Actually, it was discovered in the late 1500s when the, I think that's about when the, when the Spaniards came and, or 1600s, uh, 16 by se 1700, 1800, uh, it was listed on the commodity exchange. It was so important over in Europe uh, and closely guarded secret uh, subject of piracy on the high seas. And uh, so here, let's see. Yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, scale insects, uh, white stuff on the pad of a prickly pear. And if you grab some and pinch it, uh, then you, and crush the bugs, then you can get it on your finger. And it'll also grow on other uh, segmented cacti like the buckhorn. So I saw this on, Tom's thumb trail. Um, so uh, it's a scale insect. And, and yeah, and Starbucks, uh, they got in big trouble for uh, putting uh, crushed up bugs in their drinks. And, <laughs> and, um, and, but, and then so they switched to another dye, but the, in, the, in the drinks, or when it's used as a food coloring, the cochineal is non-toxic to humans. It's not in enough concentration, but it's a very strong dye and it works well as a food dye and also as a clothing textile dye. And that's why it was so important to the Europeans. So, uh, so it, is, it is not toxic, uh, even though Starbucks got in trouble. It, the, uh, the cochineal, uh, kind of went down in importance, uh, maybe towards the oh, towards 1900, the late 1800s, because that's when aniline dyes came in, synthetic dyes. But then it had a resurgence after synthetic dyes were thought to cause cancer. So, so that so now it it is important. It's an important commodity again. The cochineal is. And you can, you can crush the bugs and get it on your finger if you want. So teddy bear choya dense spines here, as opposed to um, the uh, uh, chain fruit choya, which has less dense spines. And a chain fruit, of course, has hanging down fruit. Um, but it, we'll, we'll see the comparison here and, and you'll be able to tell right away uh, this is this is the most drought tolerant of the choyas, and uh, and that that you kind of see here in our the drought that we've had the last couple of years, uh, the prickly pear prickly pears and and the hedgehogs and um, kind of went and even the buckhorns went down uh, more than the but the teddy bear kept on going. So, and the choy balls do seem to jump, especially if they, if they get kind of slough, sloughed off the plant and you're walking in high wind, uh, they can blow right, right on you and, and uh, stick. And that's when you need your dog comb to kind of flip them off, making sure that there's nobody in the way. 
they're a good, a good spot for uh, pack rats use the choya balls to put on their nests to deter uh, predators and birds like to build nests in the choya. All right, the comparison with the chain fruit. Uh, you, you won't see a, a teddy bear looking like this. It, it can look, the chain fruit can look like a fairly big tree. And there's one on uh, uh, over out of the, on the gateway loop and on sunrise, uh, kind of tree-like after they've grown for a while, then they can look like that. They always have the, when they're big like this, they have the hanging down fruits. But the, but the spines here, you can see are, are rather sparsely distributed. And also the thing that you notice are the, the big tubercles. Um, so so this is, these, are, these are distinctive differences between, because in the small plant, again, you may not be able to tell the difference between the chain fruit and the teddy bear, but these characteristics, the sparsity of the spines and the big tubercles, uh, that's e even in the little plant, those things are there. And so that'll be a chain fruit if they have these characteristics. Uh, but then when you see the hanging down fruit, uh, then, uh, you know, it's a no brainer. The, uh, and a big tree like cactus like this. So that is the other jumping cactus. Uh, the uh, chain fruit and the teddy bear, or the jumping cacti, but they really don't jump. Uh, but, but like I said, you know, you're in a strong wind and there are loose ones lying around. You, know, you may, you may uh, uh, encounter one. All right. That, oh, okay. Um, the, uh, the skeletons of these are also different. Uh, you'll see lots of the teddy bear skeletons lying around. And I have some examples over here. The, the, uh, uh, the holes are really pretty small on the teddy bear and they're big on the chain fruit, big to accommodate the tubercles. Um, it's small here because the teddy bear doesn't have the big tubercles that the chain fruit does. So in the, and the buckhorn, you always be able to tell that it's usually branched. Even if if not, it's got these linear, uh, you know, sort of narrow holes. So, so you can tell. Uh, let's see. And purple flowers in May on the chain fruit, and the buckhorn branch cactus uh, here. Uh, when when mature or ripe, the fruits are yellow, and here are the primitive leaves. These are soft and come out at the ends, like on the buckhorn. So you may see this. Oh, what's that big red tuft on the ends of the buckhorn branches? Yeah, it's primitive leaves. It's normal, and it's a sign of spring and the fact that the cactus is actually growing. These uh, for the fruit. Uh, the Native Americans would harvest the buds, and the buds were a good protein and calcium source, especially calcium. Uh, it is the cow of the desert, the, the uh, buckhorn cactus. Uh, the, the, the buds would be harvested and then pit baked and, and dried, and they, were, they could be eaten right away, um, right, right after baking, uh, or uh, it was also a tradable commodity. So, oh, Christmas choya, so named for the fruit. And you can see they're out there now, uh, red fruits, but they have glockets on them. So they're gonna be a little dangerous. And these spines are really onerous and they come off real easy too. So you can look like a porcupine without much trouble. Mm -hmm. So here, and thin stems, uh, they, these are, are Really, quite recognizable cacti. What eats the fruit of the um, Christmas cactus? Pardon me. What what eats the fruit of the cactus? Oh, animals do. Uh, you, humans could too, but but it'd be a, a, a real laborious 
effort to try to harvest the fruits. But, and but yeah, squirrels and, and pack rats and you know everything will eat it. Yeah, because they're good and sweet. Uh, you know, like many other cactus cactus fruit, uh, but but they're small, so so it's laborious to harvest. So what, how are we doing? Okay, so here this one. If you're having trouble, you really shouldn't have trouble telling mammal area from hedgehog, but this one is ribbed uh, and, it, and it's the first one to flower in the spring with uh, uh, big beautiful flowers like uh, most cacti have. And so the, you know, the, these spines here are hooked. Uh, I have an example, a dried out example and, and mammal area, a bunch of little tubercles. Uh, tubercles because they're smooth, not ribbed, and and the ring of flowers. But you have to kind of look for this, you know, under plants, because th this one will occur under the plants. And blooms with rain. And Arizona Queen of the Night has uh, that kind of red fruit, uh, certainly edible. I've eaten some, uh, courtesy of Mary Ann Jensen. And. Oh, this yes, uh, these these flowers are fragrant. Yeah, and I and I have uh, been lucky enough to uh, when somebody took me out <laughs> to see to see where they were because you can't uh, you know it's a lot of trouble to try to find find them yourself uh, even in, even if you're doing C and M and looking around. Only one. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's yeah. Like that. You probably walked by many, many others, just like the oh, researchers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but it's a real treat to see the flowers. So, oh, they have a big tuber. That's the other characteristic of these things. Uh, you can may be able to get it in a wheelbarrow. So, yeah, we have the dogma there, and now we're on to the yuccas. And the soap tree, soap tree versus banana, the soap tree yucca has narrow leaves and the banana has wider leaves. And sometimes, uh, it, you know, the soap tree when it's young will occur as kind of a sessile plant, just like the banana does, uh, but the leaves are very distinctive. So narrow on the soap and wide on the banana. And the soap tree, of course, has a tree-like form when it grows up and both of them have the stalk with the bell-shaped flowers and, and here's the banana uh, same kind of flowers as on the soap uh, but the leaves are wider wider here and here they are uh, side by side uh, you have the soap tree here with its narrow leaves and the banana you can see that the leaves are wider here isn't there a moth that pollinates? Yes, yeah, specific moth, and it's an example of mutualism. Yeah, yeah, and specific moth for specific yucca. the The banana is pollinated by a different small moth than the soap is, uh, and, and different from the Joshua tree. That's also a yucca. Okay, so, oh, and Nolina. Uh, you can see this uh, Tom's thumb. If you go past the TT7 sign, uh, you know, don't don't go up to the thumb, go just keep on going towards uh, the lookout. And if you look to the right, then you'll see these uh, big, big, big grass plants, bear grass. Uh, I guess that's why they why they call it bear grass because they're big grass, big grassy type plants. They they will also shoot up a flower stalk. And the stalk and the flowers were edible by the uh, Native Americans, and the uh, leaves were used for weave weaving. And uh, and uh, tell the difference between the agave and the yucca. Uh, the the yucca has hairs on the edge, these white hairs, and the agave has teeth. So and the agave leaf is a little bit wider also. But I think this characteristic is always there, the hairs versus the teeth on the agave. And of course, the agave, uh, the 
this is fibrous on the inside, the leaf. So uh, sisal rope is a good high quality rope. And it's also famous, the blue agave down in Mexico for tequila. Uh, I have to harvest the heart. And you can see agaves here. If you go off trail, you can probably see agave americana, uh, which is more, which is this. Th this is this is in my yard here, uh, given to me by another steward who uh, construction, and they dug up some agaves that were that were in the desert. Um, and uh, but the the uh, Tumi's agave is a smaller agave. And you can see that if you go, go on by the TT7 side, on up to the lookout and on up to the end of lookout and there are too many of the Gavi up there. The aloe, not a problem because it doesn't occur here. Uh, an example of convergent evolution. Uh, but the, the leaf on this, on the inside of this is all gooey and used in cosmetics. Uh, whereas it's fibrous in uh, agave. So, and here it is that they both have teeth, but the teeth are more onerous on the agave than they are on the, they're just little soft teeth on the aloe. There's some tumi agave up on uh, Bell Pass. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, they would be also, but uh, that's the place where I know for sure. And uh, Bell Pass, I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> so. Okay, on to the trees. I'll have to move a little faster. So in this family, Fabaceae, the lagoon family, uh, defined by the flower. And on the foothill in the blue, there is a banner petal. And the banner petal in the, um, in the blue is yellow. So all the petals are yellow on the blue, uh, blue petal verde. And they are on the other uh, the other ones, aside from the foothill, the foothill uh, has a white banner petal. So the uh, the blue is the one that blooms first, and uh, and so it looks really bright yellow. Uh, but then, but and then it looks like things are fading out. But that's just the uh, the foothill coming in. Um, there, there was a. Uh, uh, so, down at Tucson, um, one of the, uh, uh, a person found a grove of, um, uh, of Palo Verdes that were actually a triple cross between the blue, the foothill, and the Mexican Palo Verde, and uh, had the good characteristics of all those big flowers and not very messy, smaller leaves, still has pods. The pods of all the palo berries are uh, edible. Uh, so, so the and they all have the banner petal. The uh, also now the acacias, the mesquite and fairy duster have puff balls and catkins for the flowers, and the ironwood has a P-shaped flower, uh, which has a, a fused uh, banner or it's a a, a low by low banner petal and uh, two wing petals and a keel that is two fused petals. So it has five petals, uh, just, like, uh, just like the other flowers do. And important with the uh, lagoon family are the nodules of nitrogen fixing bacteria on the roots, because th this means that the plant is bringing along its own nitrogen. Things decompose slowly in the desert. So not much nitrogen in the soil, but the lagoons have nitrogen fixing bacteria on the roots. And, uh, and this is a symbiotic relationship, another mutualistic kind of thing. And um, uh, so this means that the plant can synthesize uh, protein. And so this was a good protein source for the Native Americans. Um, and, the, and the dead plants, of course, recycle the nitrogen into the soil uh, when they decompose. So, so uh, compound leaves are um, many parts and foothill palo verde, small, small leaves. Uh, I, I have some examples here, but these at green stems, 
uh, along with the green bark. It looks green, green, and very small leaves as opposed to the blue palaverde, and we'll see that in a minute. And the pods are pinched. These are also quite edible and, and were a good food source. Uh, you have to get them green to eat them. And, and then you can, you can split them open with your thumbnail and then take out the, the peas in the pod and, and they, uh, taste, they taste kind of like peas too. So, and the, so the characteristics of the foothill, the, um, yeah, they have thorns at the branch ends. Uh, I, have a, I have an example there. Uh, and the one banner of white petal is a primary nurse tree. And actually both the blue and the foothill are considered state, the state tree. Um, the blue palaverde is not really blue, but, had, but does have a notable blue gray tint. So uh, that's one of the things to look for, for if you're trying to tell the difference between foothill and blue palaverde. Uh, and, and of course, as I said, the blue pal, uh, flowers earlier than the foothill and the difference in the flower and the thorns are on the branch on the blue. And, and so here uh, in, in my example, you can kind of see the, um, the blue tint, but that's really pretty noticeable, especially in the young branches and if the sun's on it, then it'll have a blue gray tint. Whereas the foothill palaverde is green. Uh, so and here's oh and the pods, the, the big difference in the pods. These aren't uh, pinched quite as tight and they're not as long, and and they kind kind of tend to hang on the tree. And here these leaves are bigger than the foothill. Uh, the mesquite has really quite well organized regimented leaves and catkins, and this is where the pods will be coming from. Lots of little pods come from the flowers. And as I said, good protein source for the Native Americans. And uh, desert ironwood with, uh, with its purple flowers, it may not flower every year, may very well flower this next year because we got the rain, if we, especially if we get another rain and maybe some rain in the spring. So, uh, and as I said, that this one kind of outlines the borders of the of our Sonoran Desert. Oh, let's see, and you don't want to build a canoe out of it because the it sinks, and uh, and it it it's also very slow to decompose, especially in the desert. Uh, and probably uh, you should refer to it as desert ironwood because there are a lot of things that are called ironwood that aren't that don't occur in the desert. Uh, the, the leaves here, uh, they are, they're quite regimented. We'll see this in a minute, uh, quite regimented in the mesquite. Uh, but if you're having trouble telling the difference, uh, ironwood, uh, they're a little bit more disorganized here. Uh, and really distinctive for the ironwood is that if you just kind of look up, see the big secondary branches, you'll see pale bark on them. And that's going to be ironwood tree. The pod is... Uh, shorter and brown, whereas the mesquite pod is long and tends to be more pale when it's mature. So, uh, oh, and and yes, this is one of the one of the ones along with cat claw. Cat claw is most owners to trim, but ironwood uh, is probably the uh, good second place uh, because the thorns will grab you. And actually, on the uh, on the cat claw, uh, you have to kind of unhook yourself. From otherwise, you're really going to bleed. You bleed anyway, but uh, and you're probably going to tear your clothes. My hat has lots of holes in it from uh, from cat claw. So the but the ironwood has the small curved thorns, but they're not as onerous as on the cat claw. All right, the bark shaggy and brown on the mesquite and pale on the ironwood, green on the palo verde. And the leaves, see how regimented this looks on the mesquite and how a little more disorganized here. And here you can see the thorns and they are slightly curved. Uh, I didn't bring along the cat claw example because I thought uh, that would be too dangerous. <laughs> People would stick themselves. All right, so here is the foothill 
at very small leaves. That's why the bark and the branches have to be green for the photosynthesis. And here you can see that blue gray tint. Uh, this has got the sun on it and see how the leaves are, tend to be bigger here and a little bit different shape. A little bit more regimented here, thorn on the end and thorns on the branches here. So there, uh, there are big deal differences really between blue and foothill. So in the flowers here at the top blue, it's got orange dots on the banner petal. And so this is the one that comes out first bright yellow. Uh, this one is pale, has a pale banner petal, difficult to see here, but they're in there. And mesquite catkin and the ironwood pea-like flower. Oh, and mistletoe occurs in the lagoon trees. And, uh, and it looks like kind of a big bird's nest. Uh, it has edible red berries, they're coming out now. Uh, but the Siri Indians waited, they, they didn't eat the red berries, they waited till they got translucent. Uh, so, and, th and they're really quite edible. To sit under the tree, shake it, have a blanket there, uh, pick them up, eat them, uh, or take them home and cook them, uh, make a mush out of it. Uh, so this is as opposed to the uh, uh, to the mistletoe back east, uh, the white berries. Those are poisonous. And so this is an example. Or symbiosis is the close association of two species and is the umbrella term for mutualism where both benefit commensalism, where one benefits in parasitism, where the, uh, the plant or the parasite kills the host. Um, so, uh, but this was controversial for about 130 years uh, because at first symbiosis wa was meant to mean mutualism. Uh, and then somebody used it uh, for, you know, had the term used as the umbrella term, and now it's for sure the umbrella term uh, for all three of those. We have uh, two other hemiparasites, and one of them is uh, white ratney. And, and this, this uh, shrub is really quite distinctive with, because of its color. Uh, you can always tell it's white ratney because it has this kind of gray purple color to it. And, uh, and it, was, it was a medicinal, mainly due to its astringent properties uh, used by the Native Americans to treat uh, gonorrhea, uh, and, but it, and it's a good forage. Its flowers uh, uh, interestingly produce an oil and has kind of a specialized bee to scrape up the oil, so rather than a sweet nectar. And uh, beautiful with uh, poppies, uh, owl clover, uh, that, uh, Let's see, both of these, the white ratney and the owl clover are root hemiparasites. So they stink, stick their hostoria into roots and then grow up like a plant. Oh, like a mushroom. Similar what? to a mushroom. What, like mushroom? Well, mushrooms do that too. Okay. Munchai. Okay. No, but the, these are, the, yeah, these are hemiparasites though. Um, so, so the, the other thing, besides looking good with the poppies, these seeds are harvested for food on the owl's clover. So owl's clover and uh, white ratney uh, root hemiparasites. And here parasites now, broom rape. Uh, it's also a root parasite though. It, it will wind up killing the plant. It looks, just looks kind of dark uh, and then pretty flowers. Uh, it was also used as a, its underground parts are edible, but it, and it was also used as a medicinal. This you can see on Upper Ranch Trail, and it's in a cat claw acacia. Uh, so the, uh, the cat claw keeps, you know, the, the uh, daughter uh, kills off part of the cat claw, but it keeps on going. Uh, because cat claw is, uh, is a survivor and sends out uh, big tendrils into the trail that need to be trimmed. So here's the flowers of the daughter. It looks like a big net uh, that's hanging in the plant. Uh, it attracts butterflies, uh, poisonous to horses. 
And here we are with the, oh, to try to tell uh, crucifixion thorn from uh, uh, either uh, Palo Verde or uh, the joint fur. Uh, this uh, has, uh, the way you can tell the Kenosha tree or crucifixion thorn is because it will have these persistent seed pods, red woody seed pods almost all year. So, uh, but uh, so this, this has thicker branches than Mormon tea. Uh, and, and here with regard to telling the difference between this and uh, the Palo Verde, the Palo Verde, if you get up close enough, you're gonna see the green bark. And you'll see these, you, if you look closely at the, at the crucifixion thorn, you'll see the hanging on red seed pods. And these stems are thicker. And healthier. They're healthier than Mormon tea. Yes, they are. And here is Mormon tea. And you can see the, you can see the little joints. And so that's why it's called also joint fur. And here the stems look thicker on the crucifixion thorn. So Mormon tea versus crucifixion thorn. If the crucifixion thorn is occurring as a shrub, so then that's when you say, oh, is that Mormon tea or is it crucifixion thorn? And so these stems are a little thicker and not jointed. These, you can see the joints and they're thinner stems. So the uh, scrub oak, uh, it's generally a big shrub uh, and has these galls on it. Th those are pretty distinctive. And it has holly-like leaves that are that have spines on the edge. And mountain mahogany, you can see this uh, certainly along Tom's thumb also. And, and you can see one right at the TT7 sign. And it's worth going there in the springtime to see the flowers on the tree. Uh, the flowers are, have these uh, really prominent stamens. Uh, so they're, uh, uh, they're, they're quite distinctive. And the leaves are also toothed and they're silvery on the underside and green on the, uh, on the front side. And they have tendrils. These are the seeds. Uh, so that comes after the flowers, of course. Uh, juniper, uh, you can see that. Uh, let's see, yeah, balanced rock, I think is the best place I've seen it, uh, but you can see it also along the trails in some areas and uh, stacked together uh, cones for the leaves, a little uh, scales pressed together. Um, and, and it's got peeling bark. That's a distinctive sign for it. And the, the berries are edible. And actually juniper berries, I don't know if that, this applies to these juniper berries, but that's one of the ingredients for distillation of gin, the cassia bark, juniper berries, orange peels. So. Ah, and here we are at cat claw. So the, the leaves are smaller than on mosquito. In, in the wash, you can, you can be confused. Uh, is that a mesquite tree or is it a cat claw? The leaves are a little bit smaller. They still have that uh, regular pinnate organization. Uh, and the catkins are, whoops, the catkins are shorter here, but they have catkins. And then they, they have these long tendril things that, like I said, they kind of tend to extend into the trail to be trimmed. So you sort of take your life in your hands sometimes. Uh, let's see. Oh, the Native Americans had use for them, for, the, uh, for both acacias, uh, for stomach problems. They brew a tea uh, with it. And, uh, and this is really, um, a sight to see, I think, uh, out of Granite Mountain, the, the uh, white thorn acacia with its white thorns, red stems, uh, and yellow ball flowers. So, so it's worth going out there in the springtime to, to see that. And I think we're uh, just about out of time. So, oh, there, there are a couple more slides. Keep on learning. And... So thanks for coming.